I hope that everyone is doing fine. And uh, before I get started with this recording tonight, I need to know if you guys can hear me clearly. I've been getting a lot of uh, feedback concerning my volume. So I'm just gonna wait for some folks to get on. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I need you to confirm with me if you're actually hearing me and if you're hearing me clearly. So, uh, Stephanie Bernadette, I just need to know if you guys are hearing me clearly. I've been getting a lot of complaints about the volume, so I need to be clear. Let me just turn this up just a little bit. And I just need to know if you guys are hearing me clearly. Anytime. <laughs> okay, you can hear me clearly. Okay, Basil, great. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. Sorry for the uh, signing on late. I was supposed to be on from 1010. But again, this thing was just giving me a hard time. But nevertheless, we're here already, so no need to cry about that. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to uh, speak to you about the mystery behind contending with evil altars. Uh, as usual, my uh, teachings are prompted by the myriad of emails that I get. And I got an email today, I think it's from Nigeria, and it was about someone writing me about uh, a husband and wife actually, and they were constantly having dreams about being in their uh, primary school uniform and so on. They're adults with degrees and all that other stuff. And as a result of it, uh, they noticed that they weren't progressing in life. It's difficult for them to not only get a job, but to also maintain a job. Aside from that, they're having dreams where people are taking their monies in the dream and running away with it, and all of this other stuff. Well, <clears throat> immediately as I begin to uh, read through email and listen to their experiences, I automatically knew, automatically knew that there was definitely an altar involved here. And for those of you who don't know about demonic altars, I suggest you go and uh, research through my uh, blog site or my uh, YouTube and look on Evil Covenants and so on, which I give a detailed teaching on it. But anyway, going back to this couple, they were complaining that they've been praying, they've been fasting, and they've been doing <coughs> excuse me, everything known to break this evil cycle in their lives. Now, I want to make clear that you could pray all you want. You could fast all you want. You could join hands in agreement and follow all of those other laws with the Bible <clears throat> subscribe all you want. However, when you're dealing with a demonic altar or an evil altar or a shrine, as it's called in, in, in uh, Africa and so forth, then you're dealing with seal covenants. And the covenants would outweigh your prayer, believe it or not, because the covenant itself that was forged with the kingdom of darkness has to be broken. But primarily, it must be recognized. Unfortunately, because we don't have this type teaching as it relates to altars, then you have a lot of Christians that are frustrated. A lot of Christians who are just totally angry about their Christian war because they feel as if they're doing everything that's required of them by God, by their pastors, and they're following all of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps to freedom, to prosperity, and absolutely nothing is happening for them. In fact, things are getting worse. So that's what tonight's teaching is about. Things are getting worse because you're contending with an altar. And if you don't know the rules and the principles that governs that altar and how you should contend with it, then you're going to have a major, major problem. So, what is an altar for those of you who don't know? An altar is a place where divinity meets with humanity. It's where human beings uh, secure a place, a covert place, or even an open place. Uh, and they begin to summon spirits. They begin to call on evil spirits through evil sacrifices. So if you see a whole heap of people gathering at some beach or river or canal and 
doing uh, incantations and rituals, or even in the forest or somewhere, make no mistake, that's an altar there, and they're calling up spirits, specific spirits to do their bidding. Now, the people that are actually doing that, and again, they don't know this, they're not aware of this, but they're literally tying themselves to that altar, and even those whom they're sending curses at, are also going to be spiritually tied to this altar. And according to scripture, uh, Exodus 20 verse 5, for a minimum, for a minimum of four generations. So like I would have said in all of my previous teachings, there, uh, let's say you don't have any kids right now, and you decide to visit a, a witch doctor, a voodoo priest, or a spiritualist, or a psychic tarot card reader, then according to spiritual law, uh, God will visit your iniquities upon your children that you will have if you don't have any, or your current children if you do, and the uh, penalty of what you're doing will now extend all the way <coughs> excuse me, to the third and fourth generation. That's a law. That's a biblical principle. Now with that said, what we want to get into tonight is when a person contents, for example, this information that I've been giving you for, for many uh, weeks now, when you decide to pray against an altar, when you begin to fast, to break evil covenants, that's contending, that's struggling and fighting with that altar, know for sure that that altar will now begin to challenge you. And I know many of you have gotten many emails and phone calls on it. Many of you called me and said, Kevin, ever since I've been doing with this thing you've been asking me to do, all hell seemed to break loose in my life. Well, I, like I said to many of you, that's equivalent to you owning a home for 20 years. You have a 25-year mortgage, and you got five more years to go. And for some reason, you fell into financial difficulty, and the banks and lawyers are now coming at you wanting to snatch your home that you've invested 20 years of your hard-earned money into. You know just as well as I do, you're not just going to surrender that home. You're going to fight tooth and nail because it's your property according to you, and you're going to fight to keep it. Well, it's the same thing when you're contending with altars. The spirits that are at that altar, that are responsible for that altar, when you begin to come at that altar with fasting, with praying, with rebuking and renouncing and denouncing and disassociating everything that is tied to that altar concerning you and your family, then these spirits are going to fight. These spirits are going to come at you every which way but Sunday. Again, and the reason is you're challenging uh, territory and forces that you didn't know before. The, you were ignorant of these things before. So now when you begin to fight, they're going to come at you. The point I really wanted to, to sit on tonight is when you're coming against altar, and this is going to be one of the most important points I'm going to make tonight. When you're coming against evil altars or shrines, it is imperative, it is imperative that you make it a point to live right. That, that is key. Mind you, as time go on, you're going to see the victory. You're going to see many, many, uh, you're going to produce many testimonies from severing yourself from these altars. Things are going to bust loose for you. Promotion, uh, advancement, uh, favor. Uh, all of those horrible dreams and stuff are going to either slow down or come to an abrupt end. Life is going to turn around, but on the heels of that, you will be challenged. So con the mystery behind contending with evil altars tonight is to, to point out to you the necessity of living right. And when I say living right, I'm not talking about being perfect because we all sin every day. I'm talking about making a conscious effort to do what is right according to the laws of God. If you don't do this, then you are opening up your life for an onslaught of demonic forces to literally make your life a living hell. Okay? So, I want us to go into 1 Kings tonight. 1 Kings chapter uh, 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. I hope I'm sure you guys have your, your pen and paper and so on because you know you don't come to class with all these tools. And we're going to learn tonight. And from this teaching, it's going to even better prepare you how you need to uh, handle yourself in order to fight these spiritual forces that are consistently 
<clears throat> fighting you. So in 1 Kings chapter 13, it says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, meaning God sent him. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now Jeroboam, if I'm not mistaken, was the king of Israel. However, he was an evil king. And like the scripture just said, he was standing by the altar. This wasn't an altar of God. This was an altar dedicated to Satan. This was an altar where evil sacrifices were made to summon demonic forces. And any place, any land, any property where an evil altar is set up by a witchcraft and obe and voodoo and calling up of spirits, then that immediate area is cursed along with the people that inhabit that immediate area. This is why you will find like you living in a house where someone in that house is practicing witchcraft but you have no knowledge of it. However, the effects of the curse that comes along with what they're doing is gonna affect everybody in that home and in, in, in that bloodline. There are many instances of this. For example, uh, the story I think is in uh, Joshua chapter 7. It spoke about the, the walls of Jericho collapsing. And the instructions to them were not to partake or touch anything in Jericho once the walls would have collapsed, except for the things that God tell them that they could take to put in their treasury. The reason for this, and a lot of people don't know this, was that the things that they had in Jericho were dedicated to their gods, to their idols, to their shrines, to their altars. And whatever is uh, dedicated to an altar, then that thing becomes curse. Anyone who handles that, anyone who has that in their possession, on their property, on their person, then themselves and the surrounding area in which that thing is located is also going to be cursed. So this is why you find like mommy or daddy or grammy or someone in the house practicing witchcraft. Now, let me, let me clarify this because a lot of you would say, well, praise God, I ain't under that umbrella because I know mommy is a Christian and I know daddy is this or grammy is this or, or Addie is this. No. See, witchcraft don't necessarily mean cutting off a chicken head and sprinkling the blood on you and, and chatting some stuff. Witchcraft is anything that is, is associated with it. For example, I, I make this uh, argument all the time. If your Grammy is uh, sold to, she's a Christian, but she's sold to the tradition of protecting herself. And the way that she does this is by mopping the floor with turpentine, uh, sprinkling salt in four corners of the home on the outside, uh, drinking certain concoctions uh, made by witch doctors to protect them or to heal them. See, all of these things where you cannot find scriptural evidence to support, then more than likely the origin, the origin of these traditions, the origin of these, tra of these rituals are from a, 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 not only a witchcraft uh, origin, but it will always lead back to an evil altar. Thus, anything, be it a tradition, be it an object, be it some paraphernalia that originated from that altar, then that item, that thing, that person is cursed. And anyone who handles that person, anyone who handles that thing will also become cursed and spread the curse among the innocent also. Going back to uh, the Jericho wall. You remember uh, Achan, that's his name. Achan was the one that actually stole some stuff out of Jericho, okay, and hid it under his tent. Now remember, God told him from day one, take nothing of Jericho other than what I tell you to take. He says, least you become cursed. Why? Because the items that they had there was to dedicate it to their gods. So Achan only had a short vision and saying, okay, I guess these clothes will look good on the wife and this nice Tommy pants will fit God on me or this whatever. He didn't know 
the curse that he was taking to his tent. Because the Bible says that he buried the items that he took under his tent and nobody knew. Now, earlier in the book of Joshua, the Bible says in Joshua 1, it says that God promised Joshua, he says that be of good courage and all of this other stuff and he will be with him and no nation will be able to stand before them. However, after they would have defeated Jericho and they went on to Ai, which was a fraction of the size of Jericho, Ai began to roll them out. Some of them died, I think about 300 of them. Joshua in turn went to God and he was confused because he was like, God, I mean, you're God, you cannot lie. How could this be? You said that no nation would be able to challenge us. How is it that not only another nation challenged us, but this minute, small, insignificant uh, nation of AI, how is that possible? God in turn said to Joshua, he said, get up for Israel. Now this, this is where it becomes interesting. Israel, plural, has sinned against me. Joshua in turn went back to the children of Israel and began to inquire uh, of us to who would have done whatever. Achan decides to be honest and admit that he did, in fact, went and defy the command of God and took of the accursed thing. Now, this is what you need to look at in the story. This one person, this one Achan guy, went and took stuff that was of a demonic nature. But the spiritual implication of what he did spread a curse over the entire nation of Israel. What was the evidence of this curse? The evidence of this curse was they could not prosper. They could not function as to the anointing that God had on them. They were able to kick up Jericho with ease, shut down the whole place, knock down the whole wall through supernatural powers through their obedience. However, what Achan did, it shut down, the, it suspended the power of God over that place. So therefore, spiritually, their enemies were able demonically to overcome them, even though God was their God. And that's very interesting. Because what it says here now is that if you in your home right now and you have a mummy or a daddy or an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent who is committed to their tradition, and tradition mean that all of that garbage that was passed on to them, uh, tradition that is, what was the origin of these things? What was the origin? I met a lady one time who, who came to me in, in desperation, asking me to please pray with her, you know, because she feel like she's losing her mind as it relates to the weird supernatural stuff that was going on in her home. And she told me that she went to her pastor, and listen to what her pastor said to her. He told her that she need to get some salt. This is the pastor now, he ain't tell her to read no scripture, or let's go pray, or let's see God. He said, let's, you need to get some salt, and you need to put it around your home. This is a man of God, this is a pastor. This is a shepherd leading the sheep of God and listen to the advice that he's giving her. So I said, you sure your pastor would have said something like that to you? She said, yes, sir, Mr. Dewey. I said, don't tell me when you did it, it got worse, right? Yes, sir. I said, I know. Because you are using the tools of the enemy to defeat the enemy. That, that, that even sounds stupid to me. So I said to her, you, you, you need to voice of all. Uh, we need to discover what's happening. And of course, we would go through the history with them and you know, learning about their family lineage and connections and so on to find the spiritual order of what's happening there. So going back to Achan now, what Achan did, Achan caused a curse to fall upon them. Just like someone in your house right now, someone committed to calling the psychic line, someone committed to reading horoscopes, someone committed to uh, reading these uh, witchcraft books uh, to, to conjure up spirit. See, they're ignorant, you see? They're ignorant to the the long-term implications. See, all that spirit want to do is for you to agree to give it the right to be in your, 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 your circle. Once you would have done that, however means you would have done it, whether going through the witchcraft people or using the witchcraft books and calling them up yourself, you have given that spirit right now, and every spirit that is called up brings along with it curses. Again, back to Aiken. Aiken, singular move, brought a general curse over Israel. 
So again, the mystery behind contending with all this is that you, you need to understand what you're dealing with and what you're up against. Because you're dealing with a, a myriad of foul, wicked, demonic spirits that have a covenant agreement, more than likely with your ancestors, to dominate your family line. So what we look at now to prove this is we look at history and negative patterns. History, for example, when we see a, a, a history or an evil pattern of a particular sickness in that family, heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, cancers, divorce, the women not being married, the men be when you see that negative pattern, make no mistake, make no mistake, you are dealing, you aren't just dealing with the devil, you are dealing with an evil altar, you are dealing, and when you hear that word altar, think covenants, there are covenants that was established at that altar, there were certain things that was given, uh, grandparents, grandmother, or, 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 or even parents, they, they made packs with these altars, surrendering our destinies, who some of us who weren't even born yet. Okay, I, I surrender my thought for a generation for wealth, for health, or to be promoted on my job. And when they do that, an agreement was established, having evil spirits assigned to everyone that would be birthed through the bloodline of that person. So everyone that would have been birthed through the bloodline of that person, spiritually they are programmed at a certain age in their lives where the cycle of that negative pattern, be it divorce, be it a, a consistency with cancer, whatever, will now begin to run its course in the life of that individual. So when you see patterns, evil patterns, know for sure there's an evil also involved here. Also, dreams. When you're having dreams, again, that's always taking you back to your child at home, or you're having dreams where you're in your school uniform or primary or high school uniform, or you're having dreams where dogs and, and, and cats are chasing you, or you dream about cockroaches and all these other stuff. All of these dreams, especially if they're consistent, they are pointing to an altar that is speaking to the destiny of your life. That meaning, meaning that altar is controlling your life. You know what's even worse? Because a covenant is all already in place, it's easy for anyone to work witchcraft on you. It's easy for anyone to speak curses over your life. Because you already curse. There's a curse already on you. So that means, let's go back to the scriptures now to make sense out of this. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says that the curse, no curse could come upon a person without a cause. So you, you are a walking cause because through your bloodline, through your lineage of family members who involve themselves in idolatry, witchcraft, the curse is already there. So anyone who want to send a curse or speak a curse on your life, it is very simple to do because the ingredient to uh, facilitate that curse is already implemented through the altars that's in your family. Okay? So, in the scripture here in 1 Kings chapter 13, it says that God sent a man, his man, his prophet, sent him to Jeroboam to set the record straight with Jeroboam as to what God is going to do to the nation of Israel, inclusive of this king Jeroboam. So the Bible says in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 says, And behold, a man of God went from Judea to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar, this is a satanic altar, stood by the altar to burn incense. So he was servicing the altar. He was worshiping the spirits or the gods of that altar. Verse 2, then he cried, this isn't Jeroboam, this is the man of God. Then he cried out against the altar. So the man of God, the prophet of God, who was filled with the spirit of God, who understand altars, know that behind every altar, there's a principality. There's a principality with thousands, probably even millions of lesser demons that is subject to that principality. So the man of God now, the Bible says that he cried out to the altar, the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus said the Lord, behold, 
a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David and on you he meaning the altar now he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places the high places when you see that in the Bible especially the Old Testament it meaning that these were places that they had their evil altar set up in the mountains worshiping Satan calling on evil spirits to saturate the land this is why everybody was doing whatever they feel like doing and breaking every law of the Bible possible. So, so the man of God was now prophesying. And listen to this carefully. He's not speaking to Jeroboam. He's speaking to the altar as if it's an actual person. But the reality is he's speaking to the principality behind that altar. And he's telling the altar, God is going to raise up a young man by the name of Josiah. And the same altar where the sacrifices are made to release demonic spirits over the land of Judah and Israel. He says, every one of those priests. Now the priest he's talking about here is the satanic priest. Remember, Jeroboam was an evil king. Jeroboam served idols. He served altars. He served shrines. He had... He had ordained the or voodoo priests. Hello, just like how the good kings of Israel who serviced the tabernacles and had godly priests. Well, no, this was an evil king, and this evil king had instituted obeah workers, witchcraft workers, uh, men that were dedicated to the service of those evil altars. So this man of God, whom the Bible uh, failed to name, is now reading the riot act, not to Jeroboam the king. He ain't checking for this dude. He's speaking to the invisible forces that's 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 governing this altar. Now let's put a point right here because you could scratch, you could write this down. Right now, if you know you're dealing with altars, remember, don't ever get caught up on the people who you think working will be on you. Don't ever get caught up on the people who you feel fixing you or put something in your chair or put something in your food. See, those people are just the they're the, 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 the instruments used by evil spirits. And I say this to you over and over. If you're dealing with witchcraft in your life, if you see evil patterns in your life, then no, not only is witchcraft present, but evil altars are the source. So you need to contend with the altar. I don't care how much pastor pray for you. I don't care how much they put oil on you. I don't care how much they go off in tongues. No, 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 no. Just like the man of God, he had nothing to say to Jeroboam. He spoke to the altar because he knew spiritually there were forces there that you could not see, but that is what he had to contend with. So if it is your desire to shut down witchcraft and obeah and voodoo in your life, then you don't go after the practitioner. You don't go after the witch doctor. You, 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 you hear what this man said? He says, altar, altar. He speak, he's calling it for it. He says, the Lord will raise up Josiah or whatever the fella name. And he, this same guy who God is going to raise up, is going to break the bones of these wicked demonic voodoo priests on this same altar right here. And I don't have time for us to go into the history of what would actually happen because I'm really only solely dealing with contending with altars tonight. So you got to speak. You got to speak to the altars if, if you if you many of you listening to me right now and of recent i've been having so many counseling sessions with people who are being attacked supernaturally where spirits showing up in the nighttime and and pushing them and poking them and trying to touch them inappropriately and they hear see all of this are signs that an evil altar is speaking to your destiny. Those spirits are coming to harass you. Why? Why? Because there is a covenant. Someone in your bloodline or someone who's projecting witchcraft at you have some, your photo, your fingernails, clipping, your hair samples, or clothing that just went missing out of your home, or you had something hanging on your clothesline and all of a sudden it's gone. Why it gone? Because they're, they're taking these things and resting it on the altar. But don't think about just the block or rock or altar. No, there's a spirit behind that altar waiting for a sacrifice to be done, be it a goat, chicken, pig, because the blood of that altar give life to the altar. That's what sealed the covenant. So the spirit's now going to ask, what do you want us to do? What, what do you want us to do for you? Okay? We don't want Kevin to prosper. We don't want Kevin 
to, to get promoted in life. We want him to be on his job forever and never get promoted. In fact, we want him fired. So therefore, the practitioners of that altar come together. Listen to me here. Just like that Bible says, the Bible says where two or more of us come together, touching it, that is a biblical principle. That is a spiritual law. But in this case, it's done for evil. So they come together and they begin to chant and they, we agree. We agree. And we agree with the spirits that Kevin will not prosper. Kevin will not go forward. Now, what, how are you going to notice? The dreams are going to start. The dreams are going to start. You're going to, the, the initial phases of it, you're going to be high at night. Things pressing you down in your bed and you cannot get away. But the reality is these spirits, make this clear, these spirits are not holding you down physically. Let's get this straight. You woke up and you, you cannot move. But the reality is there are no prints in your arm. There's no pressure like nails or fingers in your chest. No. You know why? Because they're holding down your spirit. Remember I always say to you, the real you is your spirit. And those spirits from the altar now, they're coming and they're holding, they're tormenting you. This normally happens late at night. This normally happens right on the brink of you dozing off to go into your sleep. You feel these attacks or you feel this presence come in the room. Or you feel the sinking pressure in the bed. Or sometimes you even feel the bed given like a little vibration. And you, you pause to see if this really you losing your mind or if this is really happening. There are some people who will literally hear footsteps in the house. Or hear uh, little crackling stuff in the roof. Sometimes you would hear like the door just open automatically. See, these spirits are coming to torment you. But at the same time they're coming to torment you, and this is a very important point, the truth is they're trying to get more access through, to your life to even put more pressure on you. How is this? I told you before in my teaching on fear, the foot soldiers of the kingdom of darkness are the spirits of fear. In fact, they open the door. They're the one. They're the one that are sent ahead to bring fear to you. So the initial spirits that will come to you will be imps, imp spirits to torment you. You you see you have, you put something down on the table and you went back and all of a sudden it ain't there no more. Only you live in this place. Only you live in here. You can't have everything you put down. You can't have fine. Uh, the car wouldn't work. Everything just breaking down. A the spirit of fear is trying to get you to confess exactly what's going on. That's number one. But more importantly, those spirits, because remember, you're dealing with laws, man. They just can't deal with you because they want to. Now, for them to be more empowered, even though there's agreements at the altar against you, and for them to go to the next level in your life, it's going to require the confessions that you make. So when you're telling your friend, child, I was so scared last night, man, I feel like something was in my bed. My God, man. Boy, look, I ain't nobody can sleep in there no more. Listen to what you're saying because you are making declarations. You are making verbal utterance and confessions that are giving the evil invisible forces the legal death and life is still residing in the power of your tongue. Again, let's go back to 1 Kings 13. When the man of God began to speak to the altar, he did not speak to Jeroboam who was had incense at the altar. The man of God was speaking to the spirit. And I'm trying to get you tonight to understand that it is the spirits that you need to deal with. Excuse me. That person on your job who you know dealing with witchcraft or OB or that person in your family, man, don't let the things they dealing with scare you. Because when that happened and you succumb to that, honestly, you're working in harmony with them against you. So you got to rebuke fear. It's a spirit. That's how you have to put it in your mind from this day forward. If you are feeling fearful right now, remember what the scripture says. First, sorry, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. He, God, did not give us a spirit, hello, spirit of fear. So what is fear? Class, spirit. Fear is a spirit. The dictionary rendering of the word fear speaks of an emotion or a feeling. That is correct. However, from a spiritual perspective, the feeling or the emotion of fear is only evidence 
that the spirit of fear is present. So once you feel that now, this, 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 this spiritual knowledge now, you begin to speak, spirit of fear, I reject you. Spirit of fear, I bind you. I refuse to come in agreement or make declarations for you to operate in my life. I refuse to say things that give you the right to suppress me or to overcome me. I command you by the blood of Jesus. I command you by the power of God. I command you by the Almighty who resides in me via His Holy Spirit. I reject you. I renounce you. I command you to be bound and to be tormented before your time and cast into the abyss. The Bible says that spirits can be tormented before the time. The Bible says that when Jesus uh, went and visited the, the lunatic man, the spirit, the demon that was in him says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, why thou hast come to, to, to torment us before our time? So therefore, that scripture is revealing to us that spirits can be tormented. But how are they tormented by us? I remember one time I was having a, a counseling session with a lady. <laughs> I'll never forget this. And she told me she's Christ the Spirit. I tell him, get the F out here, an F, F, F. And I was sitting there wondering if someone had right. You, you, you using the F word? To, no, no. Tormenting those spirits is uttering the word of God. Tormenting those spirits is speaking what does said the Lord in his word. So that's how you torment them. So when you feel that fearfulness, know for sure the spirit of fear is there. Now that you understand that, you now begin to quote scriptures because your scriptures, which is the word of God, which is the laws of God, which is the principles of God, becomes your spiritual sword in the realm of the spirit, cutting asunder those spiritual entities that were coming against you. You do that for one or two days when that started to happen and you watch how it's going to decrease. Because see, now they figure, oh, oh, hold on, she knows something. We just cannot come at her at random anymore. Okay? We cannot come at them. We cannot come at them at random anymore. Now somebody's telling me that my volume is low. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to adjust this just a little bit. And then you just tell me if this made a difference. Okay, is the volume any better now? Somebody let me know because I, I don't know, I'm on a roll right now. So I need to know you hearing me clearly. So let me know. Can you hear me now, anyone? Volume is fine, you good? Okay, beautiful. Someone says fine, then I'm gonna go with that person. Now what I believe happens at times is that sometimes uh, when so many people are on, this internet just start to trip with the freezing and all of that. But anyway, so you got to now speak to the spirit of fear. Stop being all curled up in your home and every little crack you hear, you, 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 you tremble and shake and no, 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 no. Greater is he that is in you than any spirit in the world. In fact, they are afraid of you. You need to show them your power by decreeing the word of God, by speaking the word of God, by shutting them down and command them to leave your residence. So going back to 1 Kings chapter 13, it says, And behold, a man of God, beginning at verse 1, went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam, who was the king, stood by the altar, the satanic altar, to burn incense. So this demon fellow was worshipping other gods. Verse 2, Then he, which is the man of God, cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, So this is what the man of God is saying to the altar. He said, O altar, altar, thus said the Lord, Behold a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you, meaning the altar, he shall sacrifice the priest, that's the voodoo priest, of, of the high places, because that's what the voodoo priest is in charge of, who burn incense on you. The man of God, remember, I don't want you to get lost, he's still speaking, he's still speaking to the altar. So if me and you were there, we would think his head ain't right because he's talking to a bunch of stones as if he's talking to a person. So it says that uh, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David and on you altar he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places and burn incense on you and men born shall be burned on you. He's talking about the 
the, the, the desolation of the altar, the same altar in the future. Verse 3 says, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord had spoken. Now, this is still the man of God, the prophet. He's a nameless prophet. The Bible doesn't say what his name is here. And again, for those of you just coming on, this is 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 3. And he gave a sign, the man of God, the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Verse 4. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he, now, I want you to get this now, Jeroboam now is listening to this man prophesy the demise of this evil altar and the spirits that are attached to this altar. Jeroboam have a problem with this because number one, he's the king, and number one, he serves this altar also. And this fella, this no-name fella, decides to come here and put moat on his altar, or we can have a problem right now. So verse 4 says, So it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar of Bethel, that he stretched, this is Jeroboam now, stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! Then his hand which he stretched out towards the man of God, with it, it dried up and it froze in the air so that he could not pull it back to himself. So here it is, and this is why I tell you, man, listen, if you as a person who, who got God in you and you believe God's power is greater than any other power and you're feeding your spirit man through the word of God, but listen, I don't care who the obey man is. I don't care who the voodoo man is. I don't care what they working against you. Listen to me, you run the show there. But you got to rise up with confidence knowing these things, these altars, rules, principles, laws, high places, evil priests. You need to know these things. So when you go into battle spiritually through prayer, and, and all of this is going to change your whole strategy of prayer. And ain't no more that little now I lay me down to sleep business. You going out there dealing specifically with the spirits behind that altar. So Jeroboam, he's at the altar and he stretched forth his hand and telling his his men, arrest him. And the Bible says that his hand uh, withered in the air, dried up and freezed that he could not pull it back. Verse five says, the altar also split apart. Now you see this, God is backing this man. God is showing to the, this people of Israel that look here, my power is greater than these evil, wicked altars y'all are serving. My power is greater. And stop walking around in fear that, oh, I hear he's wake old bear. Oh, I hear she's wake old bear. Oh, I hear she's put stuff in people's food. Well, that's great what they just do. But I'm not going to allow what I'm hearing about them to supersede the God that resides in me. I believe in God. He is almighty. He is almighty. More mighty than the old bear. They could plant whatever they plant. But you don't sit there and speak of it. Father, whatever they plan, the spirits that's attached to it, I send it to them in the name of Jesus. I send the spirits from that altar and bring confusion among them and that them and their altars will be confused. Them and their altars will fail. Them and their altars will be disgraced. Them and their altars will be brought to an open shame so that people will see firsthand that there is no power greater than the power of God. So this, this business of, oh, I hear, I don't care what they just do. Many have sent curses after me. Many have sent spirits after me. Ma many nights I've heard them walking and, and doing all of this nonsense. And what did I do? I rise up in my bed and I spoke to them. You wicked, evil spirit, whatever altar you come from, I send the fire of the living God to that altar. Just like how the man of God spoke to the altar. And the altar had to listen and obey. The same power you have. You don't sit back. You don't sit back, you got all the lights on in the house because you're scared to sleep in the dark because you don't want this thing. You hear walking around, jump on you. No. <laughs> no, man. No. Greater is he. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Gr listen to this carefully. Greater is he, the Holy Spirit, 
is greater than any other spirit of death. So you must speak to that spirit. And see, when you speak to that spirit, you're speaking from a spiritual perspective. You are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. An angelic host, they are waiting for you to utter the words of the Bible, the rules, the laws, so that they can take action against these evil, invisible forces that has been sent to torment you and to put fear in you. Uh -uh. You put fear in them. So verse 5 says, And they also split apart, and the ashes poured out, the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered, now this Jeroboam now, his, mo his talk changed now, all I had, mo he had, but, but seize him and arrest him. Watch him now. Verse 6 says, Then the king, which is Jeroboam, answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me. Oh, now you realize my God is greater than your God. Oh, now you humble yourself because you see who run things here. All this time you were serving this altar. All this time you was calling up spirit. All this time you were sending spirit to torment people. But you see today those same spirit, Mr. Jeroboam, who couldn't, who you was calling on, could not help you. And now you have to call on that same God who you was in a re rebellion against. So Jeroboam asked the man of God, please, please tell Mr. Jesus, ease up off this pain. I, let me bring my hand back down, man of God, please. So he's humbling himself. Watch this now, verse 6. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was originally. Now watch this. This is where we can really get it into it tonight. Verse 7 of First Kings chapter 13. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. Now for those of you getting a little confused, I'm reading from my open Bible. I'm not using my uh, King James study Bible tonight. So the word, because it's much more simpler to understand than the Tao and all that other stuff. So verse 7 says, Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. Watch what is happening here in verse 8. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Because this has everything to do with what we're teaching tonight. The mystery of contending with evil altars. That's our topic. So verse 8 of First Kings chapter 13 says, But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you. Nor would I eat your bread, nor drink your water in this place. Why is he saying this? Remember I tell you about the altar? Wherever there's the altar, everything comes there. The food, the water, everything. Everything. Stop eating from these people who you know into wickedness. Stop eating and drinking and taking items from them. Because everything about them is cursed if they're messing with that stuff. So the man of God said to him, he says, homeboy, if you give me half your palace, if you give me half your duplex, I don't want nothing to do with you. I don't want nothing, period, to do with it. Watch what he says here. Verse 9 says, for so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So, God instructions to this man. Boy, this is going to be so sweet tonight. Yeah? This is going to be so sweet. I got to calm down because I'm getting excited already. God told this man of God before he went to Jeroboam to deal specifically. His mission solely is to deal with evil altars. He ain't there to win no souls. He ain't there to run no uh, choir. He ain't there to set up no raise, no funds, or none of that. His sole purpose, the only mission he has is to deal with evil altars and read the right act of Jeroboam to tell him what God has already uh, orchestrated in the future as to what was going to happen. But God gave the man of God specific instructions. These instructions, and I want you to hear this, these instructions 
will now secure his destiny. These instructions will preserve his life. These instructions will cause no weapon that has been formed against him to prosper. It cannot prosper. Only if he would live right. And living right meaning doing what God has asked him to do. Remember I started out in this teaching. When you are praying against witchcraft, when you are praying against Obeah and voodoo, when you wake up in the morning and find things in your front yard or some dog or goat got it out and a million flies in your place and cockroach infestation, this is Obeah to the third power. But when you are dealing with these things, hear me and hear me well, you better be living right. You, bet, you cannot be keeping no sweetheart. You cannot be cheating uh, your, your co-workers or family members. You cannot be dealing with those things when you are dealing with altars. You want a whole new level spiritually. And those spirits are waiting. They are waiting for any opening in your life to shut you down completely. And you will see that in the story right now. So verse 8 of 1 Kings 13 says, But the man of God said to the king, Oh boy, I can't, I don't care what you offer me. I can't take it. Verse 9 says, this is what God tells me to do. This is the, the prophet telling Jeroboam. He says that I must not eat no bread. I must not drink no water from no one. Neither shall I go out the same way that I come in. Now, isn't that simple instructions? Hmm? That's like God telling Samson. Samson, your power is in the seven locks of your ear. Don't tell nobody that the day you tell somebody that is all over for you. And we know what happened to him, right? The instructions to this prophet who was dealing with an evil altar. See, the, see, the success in your victory over any evil altar, which is witchcraft, will be predicated on your commitment to the commandments of God. See, at that point, you got to make up in your mind, listen, what the, the nonsense I used to do before, I shut not down. If you got a lust problem, if, if you got an adultery problem, if you got a lying spirit or whatever it is, confess that to God and say, God, rip this from me like I never had it. In fact, make me hate it. Just how you made Pharaoh hard, hard towards uh, Moses, I want you to harden my heart towards this sin in my life so I don't want nothing to do with it because i have going up against this altar of witchcraft. See, this, this is key and you can see why right now. Verse 10 says, so he, which is the man of God, went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So, so far, he is uh, following the commands of God and as an uh, 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 obligation, God has to protect him. Even though he is in a city filled with demonic evil forces. Why? Because the evil altars are managing the lives of everybody there. Once an altar is there, remember we talk about Achan, everybody curse. Everybody under the curse. Everyone is under the curse. Ain't no exemption. You could be saved to the 10 power. If you live in that land, you curse. So verse 11 says, now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel. And the sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he, which is the man of God, had spoken to the king. Verse 12 of 1 Kings 13. And their father, which was the old prophet, said to them, his sons, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, this is the old prophet, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. Verse 14. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said, now this is the old prophet talking to the prophet of God who came to read that right ark on Jeroboam. And he said, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Verse 15. Then he said to him, this is the old prophet. Come home with me and eat bread. Uh-oh. Let's put an X right there. I want you to circle verse 15 in your Bible of 1 Kings 13 because I want to preempt this just a little bit. In this particular scripture here, remember this man has been sent by God to shut down all the obia, all the voodoo, all the witchcraft that was happening in Israel under the leadership of King Jeroboam. 
In fact, when he came there, he met Jeroboam to the altars, calling up spirits. The man now ignored Jeroboam and began to speak to the altar as if there was an actual person there. And the reality is there was an actual person there, but it was a spiritual entity that he was speaking to. So clearly this man was on a level beyond what was going on there. Now, here, here is where it gets interesting. When you're coming up against an altar, and I said it to you earlier, when you're contending with scruff, you have to be living right. If you got sin, hate, bitterness in your heart, you better deal with that. Before you make any prayer towards that altar, you need to tell God, clean you up. So God told this man now, because God's instructions to him, and him adhering to those instructions, will now protect him. So God says, when you go there, do not eat anything from them, do not drink anything from them, and do not go out the same way you came in. The reason why these things are being told, because remember at this point, because an altar is in uh, Israel, and the king, who's the king of Israel, is the head, the entire Israel is now saturated with witchcraft, saturated with Obeah, saturated with voodoo. I mean, everybody, spirits running rampant in this place. So therefore, there are certain spiritual orders in place, and God is telling him through his commandments how to avoid it. Don't eat their food because they got witchcraft concoctions in it. Don't drink their water because they got witchcraft concoctions in it, meaning the people who we go to. And he says, and in worst case scenario, don't you ever walk out that scene. If, if you came in through the front door, then you go through the back door. Don't ever go out the same way you came in. So these were God's instructions to this man to avoid the effects of the witchcraft or evil spirits affecting him. However, there was an old prophet that came looking for him. And now he's enticing him. Hey, look, yeah, I used to be a prophet too, man. I used to carry on bad in Israel, man. Everybody used to know me, man. I used to prophesy and tell them, you know, who, who they get married and all this stuff. He said, man, come back with me, man. Let's, let's go eat. So let's pick it up from verse 15 of First Kings 13. Then he said to him, this is the old prophet lying to the prophet whom God sent. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. He said, this is the new prophet, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this, listen to this carefully, in this place. I cannot do it. Why? Because the place is cursed. And even though God, he is a man of God, his resistance to the curse will be predicated on his commitment to the laws of God. So verse 17 says, for I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. So he's literally reiterating what God told him. Before we go any further, let me add this last point. When you decide to come against evil altars or contend with evil altars, the mystery behind contending with evil altars is that that altar and the spirits there are going to wage war on you. Why? Because truly you're coming to unseat them. That's like a witchcraft person living in a com community for years. And all of a sudden this man or woman of God come there praying every night, fasting every night. I mean, just licking off those prayers. That's going to cause a problem for them. So you know what they're going to do now? They're going to now do more sacrifices to call up more spirits and try to send them at this person. But... If this person is living right and following the things that God is telling them, they are untouchable. They cannot touch them. So you know what have to happen now? The spirits that originally came, who were sent by the witch doctor to attack these people, this, this man or woman of God, and now have to go back and deal with them. So in this case here, the altar now begin to rise to deal with this man of God. So what did the altar spirits of the altars do? Because remember, spirits influence people. The spirits influenced the old prophet and made him lie or the jealousy. If this this young guy getting all this fame around here, getting an audience with King Jeroboam, and not only getting an audience with him, he's bold and rising up and telling Jeroboam and this altar what's going to become of them. So the, the, the prophet became jealous. The older prophet, he was done finished. His time was done done. So the spirits from that altar use him to now entice the young prophet because the young prophet will feel now okay but well, he's a former child of God I mean of course I'm sure God will speak to him to tell me to come 
But if, if God gave you the instructions to do X, Y, Z, why would God give someone instructions to tell you to go against the original instructions that he gave you? So that right there should ring a bell. And this happened to us today, where we put more confidence in man and abandon the laws and rules and the instructions of God. And then when things go haywire on the tail end, we try to figure out, oh Lord, what happened? I listened to your man servant, right. You listened to him and you didn't listen to me. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 verse 5, he says, Curse be the man that puts his trust in man and make flesh or, or, or flesh his strength. It says that he will be like the dry heat in the desert. Listen to this piece now. That even when good come his way, he wouldn't even recognize it. This is how cursed and suppressed he is. So going back to this now. In verse 17 says, For I have been told by the word of the Lord, You shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. Verse 18 of First Kings 13. He said to him, I too am a prophet. This is the old one now. As you are. And the angel spoke to me, liar. And the angel spoke to me. So you see how they use God to get their evil? Oh, I'm a Christian too, man. You know, I've been saved for 20, 25 years, right? Yeah, man. See, this is this is what you call a, 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 a wolf in sheep clothing. So the old prophet is saying to him that an angel spoke to him by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. In my Bible, it have in parenthesis, he was lying. This is the open Bible. Verse 19 of 1 Kings 13 says, so he, which was the prophet who was given specific instructions, so he went back with him, the lying old prophet, who was being used by the spirits of that altar, and he ate bread in his house and drank water. Boy, you know it's over now, right? When he decided to abandon the instructions that God gave him, he simultaneously abandoned his safety, his security, and ultimately his life. Why? Remember what I told you earlier, and I need you to hear me tonight. If you are praying against witchcraft altars, because you can't, it is a waste that you cannot pray against witchcraft and be successful. You will fail for every time. You cannot pray against Obeah. You cannot pray against Voodoo. No, 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 no. Obeah, Voodoo, Witchcraft, Santeria, Shango, Black Magic, Red Magic, White Magic, uh, all of that, they are spiritual systems of oppression. Witchcraft and Obeah, they are systems, but they are spiritual systems to ultimately suppress and to stagnate a person's life, either a specific area of their life or in every area of their life. So because there's a system, you want to disable the system. So in order to disable the witchcraft system, you have to pray against the altar. Because the altar is the place where humanity meets with divinity. This is the place where it has been uh, uh, se separated just for them to call on the spirits. And that comes through uh, certain incantations and rituals, depending on the spirit that they want to call up. Okay, so when that spirit comes to that altar, according to the laws of the altar, because it's an evil spirit, it's now going to bring curses with it. Now, unbeknowing to the practitioners of that altar, they don't know that even though they're working a spell on Kevin or a spell on Peter, they will also be participant of that same spell. Why is this? Well, it's pretty obvious. Spirits, evil spirits, that is, have no loyalty to human beings. We, they know what their end is going to be. Damnation, eternal damnation. So why would they preserve you and protect you? You, you have to be stupid to believe that. And this is why people who involve themselves in witchcraft, they're ignorant to the spiritual implications that they're bringing to themselves and by extension their family. So while you're doing Peter over here, stagnating is not finances or bringing spiritual witchcraft to his health and all of this other stuff, you better prepare yourself because that will now come. Because the same spirit that's using you to manipulate these people will be the exact same spirit who will bring that curse. How many times do you have the spirit turn on these people? You know how many stories I sit down and listen to people who told me firsthand they were doing witchcraft and following a particular uh, ritual and they was off doing something and the spirits attacked them. Huh? I know of one person who was doing witchcraft 
and whereby they had to go summons, had the children summons the brother for the brother to now come in here and tell them go over with this little black book and recite certain ritual incantations so that a greater spirit could come and remove the spirit that was on their, 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 their sibling. These things real. They, these real stuff. I mean, you can sit back and you can play like these ain't real all you want. But if you, if you believe in an invisible Jesus and an invisible God, they gotta be an invisible devil. They gotta be an invisible demons. But anyway, so now this fellow now, when he decide to go and eat this man obey bread and drink his obey water, it was lights out for him. What happened now? The spirits from that altar, whom he threatened, whom he read the riot act to, that's what I'm telling you now. They ain't sitting back there and say, okay, yeah, bring it on, we can wait on you. No, 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 no. They will use anybody possible. And you see what happened in the story? They will always use someone who looked just like you, who claimed to be of the same fate as you, who, who claimed to love God just like you. But there's a spirit behind them who is jealous of you, who don't want to see you succeed, who ain't going to allow you to come up in this place and shut down their evil. So they're going to use someone just like you who claim to be the same fate as you to shut you down. So the spirits from this altar use this old prophet to lie to this young man to defy God. And when he did that, all hell break loose. So in verse, um, where are we now? Okay, in verse, uh, in verse 20 of First Kings 13, it says, now it happened as they sat at the table. So here it is still, the lion prophet sitting at the table with the prophet whom God sent to, to deal with the altars, Jeroboam altars. They're sitting at his table eating and drinking, having a merry time. But God is gonna send the, his spirit upon the truth, upon the false prophet to literally prophesy the demise of the other prophet. So verse 20 of 1 Kings 13 says, now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. This was the lying prophet. Verse 21. And he cried out to the man of God. So that means he's at the head of his table and the spirit of the Lord fell upon this lying prophet. And now he's about to truly prophesy. Verse 21 says, And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water with corpse. Shall you come to the tomb of your father? So it was after he had eaten the bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. So at this point, the prophet listening to, the prophet whom God originally sent, listening to this prophecy of death that this guy, the lion prophet has now levied on him. But listen what the scripture says. After he ate and after he drank, meaning that after he had this prophecy, he realized it was all over for him. So it don't matter no more. So he said, okay, let me, let me finish this last piece of Kentucky. Let me just eat this last wing because this is the last time I can see Kentucky again. This is the last time I can have this uh, 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 full-size Coke soda here. So let me take the last of this and that's it. The prophet never contested. The prophet never argued because he realized he messed up. He realized that the protection that he had in that cursed city that he was in was obeying the laws of God. When he made the decision to go contrary to the laws of God. And I want you to get this man because he believed more than a human being that he believed in the word of God. And every time I read this story, I become angry because here it is, God spoke to him personally in the beginning. God spoke to him and said, listen, do not eat, do not drink, do not go in, come out the same way you go. God told him this. So when another person comes and tell you, God tell them to tell you, shut them down. I don't want to hear from you. The same God who could have show up to me and speak to me in my bedroom, speak to me in the shower, speak to me in my time of prayer. Why he gonna send you to come tell me something contrary to what he said? That right there should have tell you this nigga straight from hell. Get him from around here. Excuse my expression here, but you know what I mean. 
But this is why you you have to be focused. You have to be, if God, listen to me, if God told you in the wee wee hours in the morning, Kevin, I'm going to bless you. Kevin, I'm going to make your name great. Then some clown who claimed to be some apostle, Dr. Reverend Soul, so come and say, the Lord spoke to them on the way, coming from Cuba or whatever, and said that he is going to uh, strip you of this, rebuke that, reject that. Why? Because a devil is using this person to make you go against what God Almighty is saying to you. Your protection, your safety in God is predicated on your obedience to his words, his commandments, his laws, his rules. Everything is governed by a law. Everything is governed by a principle. There is nothing on this planet, there is nothing in the visible or invisible realm that, have a, that does its own thing. There is a law some way, somehow governing it. I use this all the time, the law of gravity. Whether you believe in gravity or not, gravity says whatever goes up must come down. If I take this pen and I throw it in the air, I can command all I want. You will not come down. You think that pen will listen to me? No, because the laws of gravity will see to it that it goes down. Vincent Isaac Newton in 50 and 14, whatever, discovered the law of gravity. He might have discovered it, but gravity was wrong. Gravity didn't show up when he when he discovered it. I wouldn't even use the word discovered when he figured it out, because gravity always existed. So laws, the law, all the laws are waiting for you to implement them, waiting for you to activate them knowingly or unknowingly. So when you go against the laws of God, you're gonna pay. And let me prove it to you, and we can wrap up right here. God told this man, he says, listen, I'm sending you in to deal with altars. Dealing with altars, you're dealing with the principalities now. Because behind every altar are principalities who have millions of spirits that submit to them to that altar. As a result of that, God now, you, if you're going to contend that, yes, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. But for that to work for you, you have to be in compliance. You cannot be praying against altars. I cannot say this enough. You cannot be praying against altars, which is the heart of witchcraft, and live your life how you want to live it. You can't be having sex with people, wife. You can't be out there fornicating. Yeah, you could do it, but you will suffer tremendously if you're coming up against an altar. So remember, in the story, the, the, the spirit, the principality from that altar influence the former prophet to deceive the man of God, to disobey uh, our God. What happened as a result of that? He died. Now, let's look at the, the, the spiritual principles that is governing all of this. I use this all the time. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter, in fact, let's turn there. Deuteronomy, I, I know it by heart, but I really want to read it and take my time in going through it so that you would understand that when you do things you are either activating excuse me or deactivating a law that will either work for you or work against you in this case homeboy when he decided to disobey god and obey man he activated a law that not only worked against him but would have uh, caused his demise deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 1 says now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, first of all, let's get it right. Who is speaking? Who is who they speaking to? This is Moses. As a man, prophet of God, is speaking to the people of God, which were the children of Israel. They are what we are today. They were, they were Christians, you would call them. They were followers of God. They believed that uh, the God of uh, Abraham, I, this was the same God they served. So God... When, when Moses was, was reading this off to them or saying this to them, he wasn't saying this to uh, a group that were filled with, with Obia workers and which, no, 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 no. These were the people of God. This was the children of God. But even though God was their God, you would think they would automatically be blessed. You think they would automatically be blessed in the field. No, no. There were conditions. And here's what he said. In verse 1 of Deuteronomy 28, it says that, now it shall come to pass if you, the children of God, me and you, diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, listen now, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today. 
that the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. So you see, that's not going to automatically happen. You are not going to excel. Okay, Deuteronomy 28. You are not going to automatically excel. No, 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 no. He says, even though you are a child of God, there are still spiritual rules and spiritual principles that when you do them, you're activating them for your good in this case here. So he says, and he'll put you above high all nations. Verse 2 says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because, listen now, you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Because the prophet originally obeyed the voice of the Lord his God and not ate or drink or went in and came out the same way, then the blessings were upon him. The protection of God was upon him. The spirit of advancement, the spirit of, of progress, the, everything good was upon him. He was untouchable by any demon. He was untouchable by any, untouchable by any warlock or wizard or witch. I don't care what level of witchcraft they dealing with. God had a personal obligation to protect you and me, and including that guy, if I obey him, if I observe his commandments, if the word if is a conjunction, meaning that it comes with conditions. It ain't going to happen because you say you're a Christian. It isn't going to happen for you because you named the Lord thy God and you've been saved 600 years. No, 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 no. God will protect you. God will preserve you. God will favor you if you do he asks you to do. And this is why I'm reiterating to you over and over that when you come up against witchcraft forces, this is a whole level. This is top-notch spiritual warfare where your primary weapons is knowledge, wisdom, understanding, which is what I'm giving you tonight. The second part of that is the application of it. How do I apply it? How do I sit back and just because I know the scriptures, I just know I must now appropriate the scriptures against the spiritual forces that's coming against me. So back here now in verse 2, he says, And all these blessings shall, not might, shall come upon you, and they will overtake you, generational blessings. Overtake you because you did what? Obey the voice of the Lord your God. As a result, verse 3, you shall be blessed in the city, you shall be blessed in the country, you shall be blessed in the fruit of your body. All of this was happening to the prophet. Now, here is where the altars got the upper hand and God released that altar to kill that man in the end when God ordered him to die. Drop down to verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 20 because these are laws. So I'm showing you tonight that what happened to this guy, this prophet guy, it didn't happen because it could happen. It didn't happen because God was being mean to him and God could have given him a break and cut him some slack. No, there are laws that when this man acted and made decisions, he was activating something of a greater spiritual implication. So verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28 says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey Mr. Prophet who God told you not to eat and drink at these people's place. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, didn't the prophet say God commanded him not to eat, not to drink, not to go in the same way, come out the same way he went in? He said it. He said, the Lord has commanded me, Jeroboam, I cannot go to your place. But the false prophet came there and whispered stupidness in his ears that he believed. So the scripture says here now that if you do reject his commandments and his statutes, which I commanded you today, that all these curses, listen to this now, will come upon you and overtake you. Hold on now, now, we don't have to be college graduates. As long as he was doing the laws, as long as he was obeying God, the curses could not touch him. I want you to get this now. As long as he was doing what God was asking him to do, the curses, as great as that altar is, as much human sacrifices that they've, because that's the ultimate sacrifice in the kingdom of darkness for extreme great powers, as great as that altar may be, as long as this man decides to do what God has required of him or her, no devil, no demon, I don't care how much human blood they drink, I don't care how much they cut up themselves and drip it on some cat or dog and call on these different entities. 
all those spirits could do is stand up and wait for you to mess up. Because other than that, nothing they could do. And the scripture is here telling you that. So verse 16 says, Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your, your kneeling bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body. And all of these sickness now coming upon you. All of the spirit of death and poverty and lack and finance. Why are these things happening? How is it that the altars could uh, orchestrate their evil on me? Because, Kevin, there is something you're doing contrary to the laws of God. This is why when you're contending with evil altars, you got to deal with you first. What is in your life that you know is not uh, uh, right, that you know is contrary to the word of God? What is it? You're sitting down every day with pure hate and bitterness in your heart. But because you're not fornicating, because you're not out there committing adultery, because you haven't murdered anybody that you deem as big sins, you feel you cool. But you know better than that because every night you're being visited by spirits from that altar. Every night that spirit is literally tugging your shoulder and waking you up out of your sleep. And you're hearing voices in your home. Stuff calling your name and only you live there or your spouse or children are asleep. Or you're hearing pots and pans moving in the kitchen and you know nobody is out there. How come these things have the right to come up in your place and do these things? Because you're not doing the law. You're, there's something, there's some rule you're breaking. And as a result of that, that was the opening for them to come in. Just like this prophet guy. So there are many of you that God has told you certain things to do. But you allow some guy who you revere, some guy who you look up to, who's so spiritual, all right, to tell you some fascinating, dazzling words. And you took that, not knowing that when you did that, you were signing your contract for destruction. The scripture makes it extremely clear to us. I quote the scripture all the time, Proverbs 16, verse 25. And it says that there is a way that will always appear or seem right to us, just like the prophet. It appeared right to him that, you know what? I believe God really sent this prophet because, I mean, after all, he is an old prophet. Clink, clink. So let me listen to him. And when he did that, what he was really doing was saying, God, listen, I, I don't believe you. I believe in your creation more than I believe in you, the creator. So at that point, God Almighty, his hands are tied. You see, remember, he has placed his word above his name. His word cannot return unto him void. Oh, what would that have to do anything, Kevin? Let's go back to Deuteronomy 28. If you do not obey my word, if you reject my commandments, if you do not observe my words and commandments, then shall these curses come upon you. No curse could have touched the prophet as long as he was doing the work of God. If God sent you into a witchcraft village, trust me, he's going to give you specific instructions. All you have to do so that none of the witchcraft there could touch you is to do those instructions. If you go against those instructions, then the spirit from that altar will rip you apart. I'm done. And I'm telling you tonight, if you have witchcraft activities going on in your life, and I've written extensively on this, I've done a lot of teaching on it, so you know the signs to look for, then you, you, Praying against witchcraft is not going to help you. The only thing you're going to do is cause the forces against you to team up and, and make your life worse than what it is right now. If there's witchcraft in your life, oh bear, voodoo, and what are the signs? What are the signs, Kevin? What are the signs, Kevin, that an altar is operating against me? Well, I said some of them earlier. The first place is going to show up in your dreams. Your dreams will always be taking you back, always taking you back to the house that you lived in as a child. That's number one. Any dream that's taking you back to a former dwelling place, any dream that's taking you back to a former job or former employee, see anything that you've already journeyed with or completed in life, but the dream is taking you back. See, the, the purpose of the altar is to set you back. It is to delay you. It is to hinder you. It is to anchor you so that you don't ever go forward. The purpose of the altar is to defy in your life, Genesis 1 verse 28. 
what does Genesis 1 verse 28 says? God says, and he blessed them. Who's the them? Adam and Eve. There was a spiritual endowment that he placed upon them that's now going to enable them to do something that they couldn't do under normal circumstances. What was this invisible endowment God put on Adam and Eve, which was the blessing, to do what? To be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue. Or three of the first things that he said is for them to increase, to go forward, to multiply. That's why when you're born, you don't stay a baby, you keep growing. That's why when you want a job, you're supposed to keep moving up. In a marriage, you're supposed to keep elevating to different places. Whenever you are in a place in life and you are not succeeding, you are not going forward. Uh, everywhere you go, you are being rejected. For people who don't know you, hate you, doors are being closed in your face. No favor, no opportunity. Make no mistake. A system of witchcraft is operating in your life. There's an altar speaking against your destiny. The voice of the altar, there are three components of that altar. It's the altar, the sacrifice of the altar, and the voice of that altar. That's the spirit behind the altar. That spirit dictates, whoever's tied to that altar, that spirit is dictating the course of their life. The, that person is programmed to fail. They may be an uh, altar operating in a person's life. Well, another sign is like the females can't get married, cannot get married. Look how beautiful they are, and look how educated they are. Man will date them, man will sleep with them, uh, will take them around the world and travel all over the globe with them. And guess what can happen one day? One day he can just change his mind and say, you know what, I don't want you no more. Three, four weeks, a month later, he married to somebody else. Does that make sense to you? No, because it's witchcraft-oriented. Those that do get married, guess what? They will get married to the perfect person. Who is the perfect person, Kevin, if the person is on their life? The perfect person will be the perfect person that will secure a divorce in the end. Why? Because the altar, the voices from that altar, the spirits from that altar is speaking to the destiny of those individuals. The, the family is programmed to fail. Everybody hustling, everybody trying to make it. God forbid mommy or daddy was to drop down dead. All of them eight sons and nine daughters together couldn't raise money to, to bury their ma or pa. Why? Because there's a curse on the family. The altar is speaking to their finances. The altar is making sure even though they have degrees, the spirits from that altar will influence the spirits of those who God has given opportunity or favor with to shut them down. And the altar have the right to do it because why? The, the, what does the Bible say? His people perish because they what? Lack knowledge. They lack the knowledge that there is an altar speaking against their destiny. They don't know that. So you know what they do? Lord, when you can turn this thing around for me, Jesus. God, please, Lord. Give me a favor tomorrow when I go put in this application. My application? Man, the fella done hire somebody you don't even know yet. Why? Because the altar has already influenced that boss, that manager, that supervisor to hire someone else. And guess what? The person may don't have no degree which was required to work on the job, but you who have the degree will never, ever, ever make any progress in this life. So when an altar is working against you, there is a line drawn in the spiritual signs of the spiritual realm. And that line is dedicated that you will only go so far in life. Every altar, the spirits from that altar, becomes the enforcers of the covenant of that altar. When your great grammy or your grammy or your mummy or your daddy went to those people, either to go take a fix off of them or to go fix someone, or they went there for luck or they went there for healing or whatever, listen, whatever they told them to bring, they say, bring nine eggs, bring a, a gallon of seawater, bring a bakat, whatever they telling you to bring, and whatever you take them, whatever they tell you to do, you don't know this, but all of that is tying you to, that is making the covenant. It is a covenant. And when you walk away from there, you have no idea that all the way down to four generations minimum, you're going to see a trend of cancer. You're going to see a trend of diabetes. You're going to see a trend of messed up relationship, a trend of divorce, <clears throat> a trend of failure in the children. The children finding it difficult to learn in school. Why? Because a spirit of backwardness is on them. It was like that with you. It was like that with your son. It was like that with your grandson. 
every time you just on the brink of a breakthrough, what happens? The rug is pulled from underneath you. Why? Because the spirits of that altar are the law and forces of the covenant of that altar. You will see something even more interesting. Don't go do fooling, but try to get saved and try to live for Christ. Listen, just like the law in the Bible says, remember the scripture, the parable Jesus talked about, the guy who had 99 sheep, sheep safe, but one was missing. He left the 99 who was safe and he went behind the one. It is a principle, it is a rule. When the demons or the evil spirits from that altar see one family member trying to break away from this, meaning they, mind you, they know they don't tie up to the altar, but they, they're trying to get their life together and live for God. Listen, everything that could go bad in that person's life is going to go bad. Why? Because the spirits of that altar is trying to discourage them to give up. You know what? The hell with this man. I might as well just live my life, man. Just let be with him be. So when you're dealing with Obia, when you're dealing with, there's nothing to be afraid of. Ignorance is making you afraid. If you are a child of God, if you are dedicated to the word of God, if you are fueling your spirit mind every day with scriptures, with listening to teachings like this and other teachings, you are, you, you are going to become a force to reckon with. Trust me. When you, any place you come and they have witchcraft people, they're going to know who you are. They don't know who you are in the spirit. The, the, the familiar spirits then come back and report to them. Oh, that, that Kevin fella. Yeah, he coming. Yeah. So make sure Susie, who we got time over here, make sure she don't ever connect with him. Because we don't need him giving her no understanding to break free. We need to lock her down forever. We are dedicated to this family. So this is why your, the, the word of God, my favorite scripture, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9b, it says that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So this is important. You know why? Because deliverance isn't screaming and shouting and, and vomiting. No. Deliverance is as a result of knowledge, biblical scriptures, laws, rules, principles. When you could, when you could, any, what I told you the last time, the, the last time I had a teaching with you. People who excel in their jobs, who excel in ministry or any facet of life, we look at them and we say, boy, this really is a smart person, but they good at making decisions and so on. That's only a part of it, you know. People that excel in life are people who understand the principles and laws of what they're dealing with. If you are an accountant and you understand the rules and the principles and the laws of accounting, man, no one can touch you. You, you, you shoulders above the rest. Because while they're trying to figure out something, you don't know the rule. You don't know the, the formula. You, you know all of that. And that's why they got you on top. Because you understand. Just like with me, I understand the spiritual realm. I understand the laws. I understand the rules. I understand that there are two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And I understand that these two kingdoms are not equal. But God's kingdom rules over all kingdoms. And that piece of knowledge alone, I don't need to know nothing else. That piece of knowledge alone put me ahead. Because when I behave, when I speak, when I decree, when I pray, and you've heard me pray before, I pray with authority. I pray the word of God because it is those laws, those rules, those principles that no devil could stand and resist. They got to flee. But they ain't gonna flee if you're praying and got one of your eyes poke open because you play in the dark and you know the light's off. And you don't want these spirits jump on you and beat you up. <laughs> no, man. No. I Trust me. I have been there. I have. I remember days I came home to my home and meet their old bear right to the door. And I always pray, Lord, who was the poison? Show me the poison one day. Who did this? I meet the witchcraft bottle there with all kind of blood on the outside of it and these different things cut up in it. Mm-hmm. My motorcycle, one day I was going to change the oil in my motorcycle. I don't know if you told you the story before. And on my way to do it, I heard this voice as clear as day in my right ear. Very tranquil voice. Told me to sell the motorcycle. And that motorcycle was my heart. I was like about uh, two months into my Christianity in 1996. I sold the motorcycle and the guy got killed on the motorcycle. I could tell you story after story after story. When I lived alone, I would hear the people in my home. I would hear the voices. I would hear the pots and pans moving. I would hear when the presence, feel when the presence walk into my room and literally speak to me. 
So don't tell me these things, they, they are real. And that's why I'm ad adamant about teaching people about these things through the assistance of the word of God. So you sitting back there, you wondering how come you can't get pregnant? How come you've been married for so many years? Listen to this. All your life when you was fornicating, you, you got to get pregnant and you had two, three, four abortion. Now that you get your life together, you got your husband, you live in an holy matrimony and you got to do all kind of infertility stuff. Like, no, no. An altar is speaking against your destiny. An altar is speaking against your fertility. So you got to speak against the altar just like the guy the, the prophet, he didn't check for Jeroboam, even though Jeroboam was there servicing the altar. He spoke to the altar as if it was someone there. So if you're having difficulty getting married, if you're having difficulty getting promoted, and not only that, when you see a trend, every year the same time a certain situation repeats itself, there's an altar working against you. There's definitely an altar. So you need to pray against the altar. Don't pray against Mary, who you hear working Obeah. Don't pray against Tom, who you hear this work voodoo. They are just agents. They are the agents of the main players. Go after them. But before you go after that altar, get you sorted out. Get you sorted out. My advice, go on a fast. Ask God to purge you. Father, remove any and everything from me. That will become a problem as I go after this evil demonic covenant that's speaking against my destiny. So there are many of you listening to me right now who have many uh, signs and evidence of altars working against you. If you're having dreams and in these dreams you're always uh, failing exams. You're sitting down to write exams but in the dream when you look at your results, failure and altar working against you. Or you're writing exams and the dream, you wake up before the dream, uh, before you figure whether or not you pass the exam, there's an altar working against you. If eating in the dream, can't forget this one, eating in a dream, if you are eating in your dream, if you are drinking in your dream, if you don't believe nothing I said tonight, there is an altar working against you. Now, for the most part, before I go on with some more signs here, for the most part, it really ain't somebody trying to fix you, you know. For the, from, from, from my studies, from the counseling that I do with many people that I speak with, I'd go as far as saying 97% of the time, there's a family altar in that family. There's someone in the past, or even currently, uh, worshiping uh, demonic altars. They got something set up right in their home, right in the closet, right in the back shack or if they live in a wooded area, they got it way in the back of the forest, or they go to the beach at night, or to the rivers, wherever you live, or to, to canals or bodies of water. And wherever you see them go, that is where the altar is. That is the place that they summons the spirits. Now, remember what I told you earlier, and I'm gonna wrap up right now. You now gotta realize these things, so when you see them, you don't play ignorant anymore and realize what it's all about. Somebody sent me, I was supposed to get, I didn't get a chance to respond to them. They sent me a photo of uh, what appeared to be a, a chicken, a feathered chicken, I think with the beak and legs removed, that was buried to a certain tree in their yard. They were able to see it. I couldn't make it out in the actual photo, but based on the comments that I read, I kind of figured out who it was. Immediately that would strike fear in you, but it shouldn't. And let me, let me tell you why. <coughs> First things first, as a believer of Jesus Christ, what you want to do, you don't want to throw that away. You don't want to just dispose of it. According to the laws, the biblical laws, as it relates to dealing with these things, which are clearly objects from the demonic altars, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 7, God gave a specific instruction to the children of Israel when they get into the promised land, which is known at that time as Canaan, which we know to be Israel today. He said to them, when you get there, you are to burn their altars, their high places, their pictures, their images. He didn't say toss them. He didn't say break them up with a hammer. Put fire on it and burn it. Why? Because you see those things, for example, the person I just was telling you about with that chicken there. See that chicken that they had there? That place now become an altar. And remember I told you what an altar is. An altar is a place where humanity meets with divinity. So this thing that they have in her yard now, this become a legal spot 
for spirits to now come to her property and now begin to run their activity. So any bottle you find buried in your yard or some cross with nine million pins in it or, or anything like that, you set fire to it. You burn it, burn it, get gas and don't touch it wherever it is or if it's in a place where it could cause damage to something else, you get a stick and move it and you put it to this place and you burn that. You're burning everything that was giving it the power to operate there. Another thing, anything that you are given from that altar, for example, I know of people who sat with me and tell me they had a serious court case coming up and they went to the witchcraft person and the witchcraft person tell them that they would have to either put some garlic on their person or they would give them something to, for example, they would tell them whoever the person is that they're against in court to, to write their name on a parchment paper and put it in their shoe or they would have to wear a specific red shirt or something. See, what are they doing? Listen to what they're doing. They're getting you ignorantly to now covenant with their altars, but they're not gonna tell you this. So even though you might win your case, even though you might get your settlement, but that ain't all you can get. See, because now that the spirits have already done their bidding for you, those spirits are now attached to your life. And you're gonna see some strange stuff beginning to go down in your life. If you're married, listen, you you and your wife and husband gonna row like cats and dogs for no reason. I mean, for no reason in the world. Rowing and fighting, rowing and fighting. Why? Because they sent a spirit there. That spirit of division, that spirit of separation, that spirit of divorce. But you, the Christian, why are you failing in this? Because you lack knowledge. You, you, you reject the biblical principles that God has laid out to overcome these things. Just like the prophet we talk about. Again, the scripture says to us, it is a law. We, who's the we? The Christian. We do not wrestle against who? Flesh and blood. So you shouldn't be fighting and fussing with your wife. You shouldn't be right fussing with your... If, if you know something is wrong, Kevin, this man wasn't always this way. Kevin, this woman... Okay, good. Good. That's a good start. Now that you know that, you don't run over them no more. You get in your corner. You get down by your church and you begin to pray not only unto God, but ask God to send his fire at that altar that has been erected against your marriage. Every spirit of division, every spirit of divorce, every spirit of separation, every spirit has been sent to put a wedge between the union that God has secured. See, so you got to fight, but you got to know how to fight. You got to know the rules first. Mm -hmm. You got to know the rules. I remember one time I was sitting with someone and they told me about this dream that they had. And in this dream, they were in this strange bedroom. It was in them and their spouse bedroom. And they didn't see their spouse, but they saw the feet of their spouse hanging at the edge of the bed. But the room was totally not their bedroom. Number one, that's already speaks of, of confusion. You find yourself in a place in a dream and you don't know where you are. That is confusion. That's, that's the first spirit you're dealing with. Secondly, he said that when he looked to the ground, all around the bed were thousands of crabs. And he had the spear in his hand. And he decided to take the spear and stab one of the crabs. Now, all along they weren't checking for him, but when he did that, it's like it sensed every other crab and all of them turned around with their biters at him. Immediately, immediately, someone sent a host of demonic forces after that marriage to destroy it, to rip it apart. So I said, listen, you gotta tell me, you know, y'all don't see eye to eye. No, you all hate each other. You all can't stand each other. If you could kill her or she could kill you right now, your day would be the same. Yes, sir. I know, because you see, the dream, remember now, the, the Bible says, God, Jesus said, listen, we all have given you power to thread over scorpions and serpents. And again, these, these are just symbolic of spirits, just like the crabs he saw in his dream. But there were a legion of them assigned to that marriage to make sure and to ensure that that marriage fail. So many people, many people whom God has blessed with the right mate, but someone either was jealous of them or there was a curse of divorce in that family. And because no one recognized the curse and dealt with the curse and the altars, then they, they listen carefully, they were working along with the very spirits that came to separate them. How? How, Kevin, how can you work with the spirit? When you go against the laws of God, 
God law says you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but you fighting this woman every day. You cussing this man, telling him he got for nothing, he white nothing every day, and so on. So you are violating the laws of God. What are the consequences of violating the laws of God? Then you would have opened the doors to demonic activity, which is labeled to curses. Kevin, where is this in the Bible? Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15. If you do not obey my laws, if you do not hearken to my commandments, then shall these curses come upon you and overtake you. It's a law. Until you understand it's a law, until you look at this Bible, it's not just some big story book, but it's, there are laws embedded in every, sto every story of this Bible. There are principles, there are rules, there are laws that, watch this now, that once followed will determine a specific outcome. Joseph was called to be a leader, but when we read his story, we read his patience, we read his humility, we read how every time he was in a, in a situation, he was always made leader. The principles were being displayed that guaranteed an end result of leadership in his future. Now he could have gone contrary to it, but what I'm saying to you tonight is you, you, you have to obey the laws of God. Yeah, you feel like cussing them, yeah, you feel like rowing them, but it will be to your demise. Let me give you these last few before I go. How are you going to determine that there are evil altars operating in your life, masquerading spirits? You're constantly having dreams with your cousin or your auntie or so on. For the most part, they're deceased. They're always trying to instruct you to do something or pointing you in a different direction or want to hug you and kiss you. No, 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 no. Any dead person in your dream, as soon as you wake up, curse it right away. I curse that. I whatever covenant that evil spirit masquerading as my deceased friend or loved one, I reject that spirit. See, the masquerading spirit, which is really a familiar spirit, like I always say, it could be a spirit of sickness. It could be a spirit of cancer. And for most part, they will be generational spirits to enforce generational curses. So they will just come disguised as people that we love or we know. So you say, oh, look at Uncle Pookie. Uncle Pookie, but what Uncle Pookie died from? Uncle Pookie died from prostate cancer. Yeah, Uncle Pookie dead. So you don't dread, die, dreaming about dead Uncle Pookie, and you hug, hugging Uncle Pookie. Hugging is symbolic of coming in agreement. So this spirit of infirmity, specifically cancer, when you hug that person, remember you, the real you is your spirit. This masquerading spirit is a spirit. How can two walk together except they do what? I didn't hear that. Unless they agree. So when you tie yourself to this, you are agreeing with the spirit. I just had someone uh, wrote a comment on my one of my YouTube on my YouTube teaching on uh, dreaming of the dead, and man, she was telling me, man, I don't believe in that. I believe I, I don't believe what you're saying about these dead people and so on. I don't have a problem with that. Let's move on. You deal with the consequences. I didn't tell you what the law says, so you could do whatever you want to do after that. So if you see yourself in a dream <clears throat> hugging dead people and conversing with them, they're familiar. See what they mask. Get rid of them. If you're having dreams where every time you have a dream, there's someone trying to get into your home, but they can't get in, or someone is knocking, and you open the door, and they try to push, but you're pushing back, that's evil spirits trying to enter your life. For the most part, it's generational curses. See, every spirit have a specific function, and that specific spirit is trying to... See, once you open that door in the dream, it's symbolic of you open up the spiritual door in your life, and you see the spirit... Always remember this. Spirits have no legal right in the earth unless human beings cooperate with them. So the spirit, even in the, particularly in the dream, is always looking for the human agreement. Because it's an evil spirit, the agreement or the securing of it will always be deceitful or covert, thus dreaming about deceased relatives. So you've got to, to, to address that. If you're having dreams about dogs, snakes, cats, Especially if you have dogs chasing after you, or a dog, well, worst case scenario, a dog biting you, a snake biting you. <sighs> Remember, they're not biting the physical you because obviously you're sleeping. They're biting your spirit. Whatever affects your spirit in the dream will automatically affect you in the natural. So immediately you need to wake up and rebuke that. I remember about three months ago, I had this dream, and in this dream, Again, I was in this strange place. And even in the, because I'm so familiar with the symbols, even in the dream, I knew this was confusion. And I was holding like this, this black string, like a little elastic type string. 
and I was playing with it and the thing turned into a small black snake and bit me right here. <laughs> and fuck, I kind of felt it when I woke up. And I held my thing and I curse and I say, whatever demonic concoction that was originated in my dream, I reject it. I refuse to come in agreement. Whatever spiritual concoction, whatever spiritual venom has been sent to pollute my spirit, I send you back to your sender and I break the covenant that was covertly established in my dream. So you got to, sh when you when you learn, you got to shut them down immediately because they're hoping you either say, oh, that's just a stupid dream or just, you know, I can repeat that later on the day. No, 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 no. You deal with that immediately. Uh, when you're always uh, having dreams at your, your birthplace, we talked about this before, you, you grew up with your grandparents or you grew up with your mommy. You're now 45, 50, 25, 30. And you're constantly having dreams where you're back in mommy house. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Spirit of stagnation. Spirit of backwardness. Spirit of delay. Spirit of setback. There's an altar speaking against your destiny. And with the altar saying, you will not proceed no further. You will not advance in life. We, we are here to... See, angels and demons in the spiritual realm... Is equivalent to policemen in the natural realm. The policemen are agents of the law. They enforce the law. If you're speeding over the speed limit and the police see you, his job is to run you down and write you up and charge you. Why? Because you violated a law. That's the natural, right? In the spiritual realm, when evil altars has been erected in a family lineage, there are certain covenants that were agreed to. But what the practitioners don't know is that evil spirits brought curses. So therefore, those spirits are responsible for enforcing the curses. Now hold on now, there's Peter. Mm. Peter approaching 29. And the rule is for this family is that everyone who's going on to 30, they're going to be striked with some form of cancer. This is why when you learn this understanding, you be proactive. You see the negative patterns in your family. You see everybody dropping out from heart attack at a certain age. You see everybody dying before the age of 50. Proactive mean that, okay, I get it now, Kevin. I get it. I going up against that altar and I can shut that baby down that I, me and my seed will not die before we reach 50. In fact, we will live a long life. See, you need to act now. I remember having a conversation with a lady one time she was telling me, I think her mother died at age 53. And she was approaching 53. I think she's like 52. She's going to be 53 the next year. And she had this unbelievable fear that gripped her because she felt convinced that at 53, her life was going to end. So you see stuff like that, the spirit of fear moving on her because the spirit of fear wants to put the, the seal on this now that we got her at 53. So... We need her to cooperate with us by her agreeing with fear. Fear is a spirit. There are also laws as it relates to fear. In Job chapter 3 verse 25, Job said that the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me and that which I was afraid of has overtaken me. Overtaken me. What, did, what did he greatly fear? Well, look at what he lost. He lost his tension. He lost his wealth. He greatly feared those things. So you see, fear according to uh, Proverbs 29 verse 25 or verse 25 verse 29 it says that fear is a trap unto a man so you see why you have to eliminate fear and when I consult with people and they always say well Kevin I fail I say no 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 use another word use the word concern Kevin I'm concerned don't ever use that word fear don't ever use that word I'm afraid because that is a word that establishes covenant with the spirit of fear and you don't ever want to give into that because, again, they are the foot soldiers to the kingdom of darkness. All right? So, I think we about covered that. Right, okay. So, in closing here, in closing here, and I'm done. In closing here, here's what I want to say to you. I want to say to you that from this night forward, and, and, and I'm not just talking about people who are aware of witchcraft in their family. You, you, you might, you would have had your hand to it at some point. And I've sat with people like that. And I tell them up front, I say, listen, if you're going to sit with me and if you want me to help you, you have to be 
Excuse me. You got to be real. Have you practiced Obeah? Did you put your hand to voodoo? Did you follow different instructions from these people to do? See, I need to know because, you see, that tells me right away that you were tied to an altar. And the reason why the person at work will be working on you is because you already curse by going to these altars. So anyone can put a curse on you now because you're open for it. All right? I know. I was trying to remember something. That's why I was saying that. Here, I just want to remember before I go. Workplace witchcraft. Workplace witchcraft, I have to, I have to insert this in here. A lot of things that are happening on a lot of the jobs that you're on, you're seeing strange promotions or people who uh, just got controlling spirits and cussing at the boss, cussing at the supervisor, and for some reason these people got to submit to these people, witchcraft, obey. When you see one person on that job could do what they feel like doing, uh, or sleeping with the boss and got the boss hair gone or the boss can't think straight, even the man wife got to submit to to this evil person, obey or voodoo. Now, here's what I really want to get at. That person have an altar on the job. Mm -hmm. They have an altar on the job. Now, they can either have a spiritual altar or they can have a physical altar. Now, with the physical altars, this is how it will be. It will be almost like a, like a souvenir. You'll see like a little Buddha thing on their desk or some little artifact. Don't, don't let that throw you off. That's an altar. Or that's an altar there. See, and you asked me get it from. Oh, that's when we was to uh, when we went to London the other day. And we, you know, we don't pack up nothing from London, straight out of Obama house. That there, they brought that in there, and that there, that there, that's the place where the spirits meet and uh, run its course in this place. Now, how you gonna know this? You can begin to have dreams about your workplace. You can have dreams like the place where you in the area where you work, filthy, dirty, disorganized. Have you see that old bear going to bed? Witchcraft. Or you will see uh, uh, like, like, like the boss or the supervisors, like, like in the dream, like they're under spell, like, like, like you talking to them, but they can't respond to you. They, they under witchcraft powers. Or, and how you can know the person who's who, who doing it. Every so often, you can keep dreaming about the same person. And every dream you have about this person is that is never good in the dream. They're either being they're either being covert in their behavior or, or something they're doing that they're just sneaky. The dream is revealing this the culprit right here. But again, hear me well. Don't pray against the person. You come against the altars that they're dealing with, and now you ask God that whatever they're physically doing towards you, expose them. See, once you shut down the altars, they're powerless, man. They, they can't. And guess what? They can know you, you know. See, because when they go back to the Obey Man, the Obey Man can tell them, oh, no, no, don't mess with that one there. <laughs> the Obey Man can tell them, see, because remember, this is spiritual. The, the familiar spirits that's attached in that workplace will now, through divination, which is communication through demonic means in the spiritual realm, those spirits that are attached to the people in their familiar spirits will now report to the witch or the warlock. Say, man, I can't refer to man. I stay in this Bible, man. He stay in the word. He stay covering himself. He stay putting on the armor of God, man. You, you gotta wait on him. You gotta wait for him to mess up. Yeah, wait. So we can do that. Let's let's send one pretty girl in there. Let's let's try it out. Let's try to get him with lust. Okay, that ain't work. Okay, let's 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 try. Let him let him cheat on the job. See, they they can create the scenarios because the idea is, I need this guy to not just sin, you know. I need him to sin. And not deal with it with repentance and forgiveness from God. Because remember what the scripture says. If we confess our sins, he which is God is faithful and just to forgive us of the sin that we're confessing. Then he throws the bonus in there. And he says, aside from that, Kevin, you know what? I can cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Let me give you a little package deal here. So the spirits now need to set up scenarios to get you to sin but not repent. Why? The Bible says clearly, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. It says that he that hideth his sin, that word hide may not confess it. He that hideth his sin, listen carefully, shall not prosper. There's only one force that can stop you from prospering, demonic spirits. So the demonic spirits understand the law. Let's get Kevin to start lusting. Okay, we ain't gonna push the girl in his life right away. Let's just get him. Let him come to work with some tight clothes on, and, and you know, let, let's let's kind of revisit his past to him. And if he don't use the laws of God, and what is the laws of God? Casting down all imagination and anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. See, you 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 got to know the law. 
So when those images come, you 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 turn, you you shun it, you you begin to speak to the voices because they're speaking to your spirit. Father, I reject the spirit of lust. I refuse to sit here and lust after this person and regarding iniquity in my heart, where your voice says, if I regard iniquity, man, you will not hear me. See, if you don't know the law, then you can feel like a big deal, man. I'm looking, look at this little thing, we're not like me, man. Mm -mm. You're dealing with real devils who are waiting for the opportunity to deal with you. And for so long, you've been getting, so far, you've been getting away. But they ain't gonna stop. They can keep sending stuff out there. That's why you gotta keep rebuking them. Father, every spirit that has been assigned to visit me tonight from whatever altar, I bring confusion to that altar. Let those spirits turn on the practitioners to that altar. Father God, send an ambushment so that they will turn on one another, Father God. Bring them to shame and disgrace. Let them be caught in their evil acts, Lord. Let them be identified according to the works that they're performing against your servant. Your word declares, Father God, that you will never leave me or forsake me. So I am confident that you are here with me to repel, to block, to stay every dart that has been thrown at me. Father, let the ditches that they have dug for me, according to your word in Psalm 7, let them fall into it themselves. Father, your word declares in Psalms 109 verse 17 that he that loveth curses, then let it come upon him. But he that delighted not in blessings, then let it be far from him. See, these are, you pray the word of God because the word of God not only are the laws and rules of God, but it is your spiritual sword in the spiritual realm. Okay? So I'll finish there tonight. I pray that this teaching was very beneficial to you. For those of you who can't wait for me to put it on uh, YouTube, I will do it tonight before I go to bed. But I thank you. I pray that you share this video and get other people watching this stuff around because they need to know this. We're living in a time where the spiritual forces against us has been elevated. And God has been calling his people to a higher level. Been doing it. We've been ignoring it because we like the regular routine in church. You know, you come there, you do the regular routine, you punch in your time card and you go back home. No, my teachings are about taking you to a higher, higher level because that is the level that we're supposed to be performing on. So my teachings are to bring you up to that level. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your people tonight. I thank you for those that stayed on to listen to your word. I pray that they would have understood the mystery of contending with evil altars. I pray, Father God, Lord, that they would take their focus off of their people, which are the instruments being used by evil entities, and put their focus on the spirits that are identified through the negative patterns in either their own lives or in the lives of others. For example, Father God, if the person is a liar, then it's a spirit of lying that they ought to be uh, dealing with and not the person itself. I pray, Father God, that you would advance this people according to your word in Isaiah 11 verse 2. Advance them with your spirit of wisdom, your spirit of knowledge, your spirit of understanding. I pray, Father God, your word in Ephesians chapter 1, where you said, Paul said that they would have the spirit of revelation and knowledge. I pray, Father God, Lord, that you would break the spirit of ignorance that has shackled and anchored your people for so long to be conformed to a tradition rather or opposed to the power of the living God. I pray that this night will be the night where, Father God, things begin to make a U-turn in their lives. And at the same time, you could slingshot them into their destiny of wisdom, their destiny of knowledge, their destiny of understanding. Your word declares, Father God, in Proverbs 11 verse 9, it says that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Deliverance is what you know. Deliverance is knowledge. Knowledge is to be aware. So, Father God flood and overwhelm your people with the necessary knowledge which is your word so that they will be better prepared to combat the forces of evil so that they will be lord the, the, the altar destroyers for their generation so they will uproot the covenants that were that were created in generations past by their mother father grandmother grandfather great great grandparents all the way back to the fourth generation and further that has made spiritual implications through evil altars that has shackled their lives and will continue to shackle the lives of the future generation if they don't shut those altars down now. Father, I thank you for the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that you've given me to not only teach your word, but to articulate it in such a way that even a child can understand it. I now pray, Lord, that the same wisdom that you've given me, the same insight, the same ability to articulate your word, 
fall upon those who are watching me right now. Lord, let this word overpower them to the point, Father God, that they have a passion greater than me, Lord, to go out there and share this word with other people and to watch lives, plural, be transformed by the breaking of the generational curses that were in place because of the covenants instituted by their ancestors and those altars. Therefore, Father God, finally, I pray. I pray right now, Father God, just like how you send the flood in the days of Noah, just like how you send the fire and brimstone in the days of Lot and Abraham. I am asking you to do the same thing, but only this time, Lord, send a spiritual flood, send a spiritual fire and brimstone to burn and to destroy and to consume every evil altar operating against the lives of these people hearing me, watching me now, and will hear and watch me in the future. I pray for that home right now where that auntie or uncle, mommy or daddy, who's covertly having witchcraft paraphernalia in that place as a form of protection, ignorantly not knowing that that is the very core, giving those spirits, evil spirits, the right to traffic in and out of the lives of the family member. I pray, Father God, Lord, that you would send in their Moses, Lord, to bring deliverance, to bring wisdom, to bring knowledge. I pray, Father God, I, I, I deputize everyone listening and watching me right now to go forth with this wisdom tonight and begin to break the shackles, break the chains, break the fetters, and break all of those spiritual cords that once held them and anchored them to a place of limitations and restrictions all because they didn't understand spiritual warfare, all because they didn't understand spiritual altars, all because they didn't understand the armor of God, all because they didn't understand that they could put uh, angels to flight, to fight against their opponents by uttering, declaring, and decreeing the word of God. I pray, Father God, that you will elevate their understanding as it relates to demonic evil altars. Finally, Father God, just like your man of God spoke to the altar in the days of Jeroboam, I speak to every altar that has been erected against my life, against your life, against your children's life, against your children, children, beef, the children who aren't even born yet, who have been programmed to fail and take on the same cycle of disease, the same cycle of divorce, the same cycle of backwardness, the same cycle of missed opportunities as a result of the covenants instituted by altars of the past. Father, I am asking you tonight to rain down fire and brimstone and break and annihilate and destroy every physical and invisible altar operating against this your people. Set in an ambushment, Father God, to destroy the works of the evil one. Turn these people minds and break the shackles off of that man mind, off of that child mind, off of that man who all his life couldn't go forward, off of that woman who couldn't get pregnant for her husband, off of that young lady or older lady who for years was looking to be married and could not be married because her ancestors sold her destiny to those altars. But I command those altars to free up everything that has been withheld from the the, 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 the members of those specific families that are being affected by those altars. Lord, let your fire uproot everything that you did not plant in these people's lives and let it be replaced with every spiritual blessing that you already had in place in spiritual places for them according to Ephesians 1 verse 3 and verse 4. Finally, Father God, your word declares that whatsoever things we desire when we pray, that we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You guys have a good night. And uh, for those of you who are waiting for this on YouTube, I'm about to put it there right now.